Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Black Expat Experience, a live show and podcast highlighting the lived experiences of Black expats around the world. I am Kendall Tyson, your host, licensed therapist, and a fellow Black expat. And we have another great episode in store for you today. I would like to welcome our newest guest, Raphael Moffitt, to the show. How are you, Raphael? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. I'm glad I'm to so be glad here. I'm glad that you can make it today. <laughs> no, I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Look, we, we were just talking. It's, uh, the sun is out today, but it's certainly cold out. So, you know, oh, sure. trying to get this last little bit of vitamin D in before it starts to get too cold. You know? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's very deceiving today. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, I want the world to learn more about you. So I'm going to read your bio for us just to get a foray into the man that you are. Raphael is a chief student affairs officer at Schwartzman Scholar and the associate dean of students at Schwartzman College of Tsinghua University. Funny fact, I used to work at uh, Tsinghua International School. That was my first um, counseling job out here. So that's that's cool. That's a cool connection. Um, he's a native of Washington State. Dr. Moffitt, his career in student affairs at Clark University in 2002. Prior to joining um, Duke Kunshan, Dr. Moffitt served as a vice president for student services at Texas Southern University in Houston, Texas. Okay, Texas and Vice President for Student Affairs at Langston University in Langston, Oklahoma. He brings more than 20 years of professional experience in progressive leadership roles at Trinity University, Morehouse College, Georgia State University, and Clark Atlanta. Dr. Moffitt received his bachelor's degree in English from Washington State University. He earned his master's degree and doctorate in educational leadership from Clark, Uni Clark Atlanta University. Um, in his leisure time, Raphael enjoys music production, watching sports, playing basketball, trying new food, retail therapy. I mean, Beijing is great for that. Um, and spending time with his wife and son. And I can attest that lots of people have great things to say about him. So I'm really eager to get into learning more about your experience um, and your journey to expat life. So thank you so much again for being here. No, thank you. Thank you. We have so many points of connection. I lived in Atlanta for two years. Hey. Um, and clearly I'm from Texas, lived in Houston for 12 and from Huntsville. I'm sure you've heard of Huntsville. Huntsville yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So interesting. I wanted to go to Spelman when I was younger. Um, that didn't pan out when we learned a tuition fee. <laughs> we can talk about that later. I was, I was in that boat too. You know what I mean? Listen. So yeah a couple schools i was like i get to go my mom was like not for that price tag so <laughs> exactly i get it listen we as older people and parents it's like okay we we have a definite understanding of try something different <laughs> for sure well okay so one of the first questions that i like to dive into is always asking my guests is who is Raphael? How would you, what would be the brief description that you'd like to offer to the world other than what I've already shared? Yeah, I think, you know, all of that stuff is what I do, but it's not necessarily who I am. I mean, it, all that speaks to, I'm an educator. Um, I value education. I grew up in a house that, you know, with, with, two, with mili my, my, uh, my biological father was military and my mom was military and my stepdad was a barber. Um, and so they always value getting training in something, you know, and so it, my, my dad is a licensed barber, my stepdad is a licensed barber, um, my biological father is, look, again, he worked in the military for a long time, and he worked at the post office and for the federal prison, and then my mom, um, when she retired from the military, she worked for the state, and they were always like, you need to go get education, um, so, and, and travel, and travel was big, and education was big in my house, so, you know, I've, I've been able to marry those two, so, I'm an educator. Um, I'm a Pentecostal preacher's kid. I'm a older brother and younger brother. I have an older sister, a uh, younger brother. Um, I'm a West Coaster to the bone. I love traveling, but you know, I can I can almost spot folks from the West Coast. No matter where I am in the world, I'll be like, wait, 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 where are you from? And they'll be like, oh, I'm from the Bay, or I'm from LA, or I'm from, you know, whatever. I'm like, I know. Um, and I'm just I, I'm someone that really loves to pour into people. 
Uh, and I feel like I'm somebody that uh, loves God. Um, and I've, I'm a, I'm a Christian and I try my hardest to walk as close to God's precepts as possible. I fail at that every day, but then I get up and still try to strive for, um, for, for, to live a life that is pleasing to God. Yeah. Um, and after that, I'm somebody who believes in the preservation of the black family. Yeah. Um, I married a black woman on purpose. Uh, and, and she's and, great, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> she is great. She is great for sure. Um, and, and I'm somebody that wants to be an asset and, and I don't know about, I don't necessarily know about a role model to, you know, the black community, but somebody who, who contributes. So whenever my time on this earth is done, um, people in my community specifically will say, no, there was somebody that tried to pour back into us and, and tried to, you know, lift as he climbed. And, and hopefully there's a lot of people that look like you and I that can say that because of our interactions. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Talk about a rundown. Um, all of that is so inspiring and I really connect with the part where you share that your family is like, no, you have to re receive training in something, right? Our, our time on this earth, it has to be purposeful and, you know, being a, a growing up in, you know, the church, Baptist church, um, non-denominational church, um, having like you, like you strong parents that believe in you do something, you help other people, you give back. I think that was kind of like one of the impetus for me doing this, this show and podcast is there's so much that our community has, right? Mm -hmm. Innate to us character and ability. But then I think that there's so much that we are unaware of when it comes to how to continue to further our life, you know, how to continue to grow as people, expand like our territory and horizon. And this, is an outlet for that so I'm wondering what do you think what do you believe your decision and family's decision to move abroad kind of shows your you know your environment your community about the possibility of expanding their territory yeah uh, you know I think exposure is expansion and you know oh a God. lot of the some of us get opportunities to do that. And, and when I was young, again, my family, they all, actually all, so my, all of my parents, all three of them um, and my in-laws, they all were army. And so they all left from different parts of the United States when they were young and got a chance to go see the world. And so uh, it's been a part of who, you know, certainly in my family and my wife's family, and we would take trips all over the United States. So getting up and go, getting up to go somewhere was not, uh, uncommon, you know, for me. And so the more I got a chance to see other things, the more I was like, man, I like this. I like going to a city and trying to figure out the culture and the vibe and the, you know, the stuff that you should get into, the stuff you shouldn't get into, like all of it was really exciting to me. Yeah. Um, and, and most of that happened in the United States when I was younger, but then I got a chance to study in Brazil uh, for grad school for six weeks. And I've taken wow. students to Egypt, the Dominican Republic, and then just, you know, have traveled, you know, been blessed to, to travel. And so I've always had the bug, my wife and I, that's probably one of the the common denominators that we latched onto really early is that we were ready to, you know, pack a bag and go, you know, wh whenever, wherever. So um, I think it's always been a part of who I am. I, I sincerely wish that I could take every, in particular, Black person, get them a passport, and take them somewhere where they will love it and will be extremely uncomfortable being outside of the context that that, that we grow up in, you know, yeah. because I think that it, it grows us in a number of different ways. I certainly, you know, looked at the world and I thought it was just my little slice of the West Coast and the Pacific yeah. Northwest. And then the more I traveled and the more I got to talk to people and interact, I thought, man, the world is big and I can I can touch it. I can go out there and touch it and I can, you know, contribute to it and enjoy it and, you know, critique it in some in some ways, too. So I think that our community, because of all of the challenges we have um, being black, I think that it's really important for us to be able to see different things and experience different things. Uh, and that's for my son. I have an eight year old, nine year old son. And for me, I'm like, it's amazing to see how his conversations have evolved because of travel. And yeah. so I would say 
every black person needs to get out of their context, whatever that means. If it's just going, if you, you know, you know how, so you from Texas, even if it means going from Texas to Mexico, just to see what Mexico is like, is it just across the border, you know, go and then expand, you know, on yeah. top of that, when you find, you know, your, your, your palette for what, what you would be interested in. Yeah. Which is very interesting. You said Mexico, my parents used to take us to Mexico city. Um, we went several times when I was younger and I remember, and I literally share the story a lot. It comes up and just the vibrancy of people around a different place. Uh, I remember like we used to buy like big, uh, boxes of like the little chicle gum and our authentic dresses yeah. and I just from I really believe like from that point on I, it's always been I, I want to live outside of the U.S. and when I was younger I wanted to move internationally when I was in college it was like Barcelona here I come I never thought China would actually be the place that I landed Me neither. <laughs> I never thought that at all um I wonder when you think about, I love what you said, exposure is expansion. Oh, it just, it just does something to me as I listen to myself say that exposure is expansion. And I wonder all the travels that you've been blessed to be able to participate in um, either leisurely or professionally, how do you think as an individual, as a black man, that you have expanded as a person through your exposing yourself to travel? Um, I, a couple things. I think that I have, I've appreciated the opportunity not to be a black man first. Mm, mm, mm. That is such a pregnant statement. So, so, um, you know, as, as a black man traveling, I think one of the things that I've grown to discover more in the international setting is that being African American is not the thing that people look at. They, they see it, but they don't digest that first. They digest our national identity first, which, which is kind of strange or not strange, but different because in the States, it's I'm right. black first. Yeah. yeah, like I'm 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 a African American, and then some people don't even think we American, right? So it's like you're black, and then whatever right. has been assigned to that, given their background, upbringing, whatever, that's what you have to make sure you navigate. And so, I think being in inter going international, um, it was actually in Brazil, and I was on the bus, and and where I went, I went to Bahia, Salvador, Bahia, Brazil, which is you know, like African, so. Uh, during the you know the Atlantic tra slave trade, um, slaves went from by up from Africa to Bahia to the West Indies, then to the states, and so yeah. it has the largest um, um, population of Africans off the continent. And so it was black, and so I'm walking around. I look like everybody, you know, all this like it's like being around my cousins, you know. Yeah. And I was on the bus, and I was just sitting there. And this guy said, hey, you're not a black guy. He said, hey, well, well Afro-Brazilian guy. He said, hey, you're not an American. You're, you're, you're not from here. And I said, I am not talking. I look like them. You know, like I had lots at the time. I, you know, I'm in the sun, so I'm brown. And I said, well, how do you know? He said, your shorts. And I had on a pair of Nike, just basketball shorts. And he said, mm -hmm. nobody around here can afford those. That's how I know you're not from here. Oh my and I was God. like, whoa. He said, Americans wear that stuff. And, and it hit me for the first time ever that like, he wasn't looking at me like seeing this. He was seeing like the national, my national identity. And so coming to China, I think that's been one of the things too, that's been interesting is that if I'm sitting at a table with an Irish dude, an Australian dude, you know, a sister from Italy or whatever, like we're all foreigners first. Yes. And then go, oh, you're black or you're da da da. Right. And that's, that's been an interesting shift for me because I'm so used to being on guard about my blackness that it's still there yeah. but it's not first you know so yeah. that's been something I think is this really been been a of recent you know years something to just kind of digest and think through when I travel um and then I just think being able to the the, the bigger part of travel being black is understanding and embracing who we are in every context because in some contexts you go to, they're like, Kendall, oh my God, you're amazing. And, and nobody does or says anything like you. And you think, yeah, because I'm black and we got flavor. That's why, you know. 
But you can't say that, but you just like, yeah, you know, you know. And yeah, what? sometimes my face probably does. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You like, I know, you know what I'm saying? You know how we do. <laughs> um, but then sometimes, you know, you you people, you see people processing you or trying or staring at you or whatever, and you like, back home, if you're staring at me, we have a problem right. here. You probably really haven't seen anybody that looks like me. All right, man. You know, right, so bro. so the yeah, yeah. So so just navigating blackness in in an international space is is how I've tried to I've tried to break out of just my one way of seeing it in the States yeah. and really depending on the day, give people the benefit of the doubt, or just go, all right, this this I don't feel like dealing with it today and I'm a I'm not gonna I'm not gonna I'm not gonna engage it, you know, yeah. but it is different. It is different. So I think engaging in my blackness has been for internalizing how I exude blackness in different spaces is something that I've been able to to really think through and navigate yeah. being in an international space. Wow, that's a really powerful thing that you just said right there, how to internalize, internalizing how to exude your blackness. And yeah, when you come to China, I don't care what hue of black you are, it's always the, like you said, the computing what 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 right what yeah. dot 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 um but i've found you know working in international schools the exuding of blackness has i am it's challenging um cuz in the role that i'm in as a counselor i'm a licensed yeah. therapist i have this knowledge god has granted me with the ability to move with people and not over mm -hmm. people and that is accepted sometimes and a lot of times it is I don't know I don't know the appropriate word I don't have the art the word to articulate it right now it's it feels harmful sometimes to come into the space that is overwhelmingly um run other right yeah, yeah. run by you know yeah um yeah. non-melanated people but yeah. the population you serve are overwhelmingly Asian, Asian descent, yeah. other, you know, nationalities. And then yeah. individuals like myself or yourself are sprinkled few and far between. And I'm a very vocal person and I'm very justice oriented. And I've noticed that I've, I, I've really had to, I felt like I've had to reduce and modify how I show up, which can, it feels so harmful sometimes, but in a mm -hmm. way to like to protect myself, um, I wonder, did you experience any of that in the professional settings that you found yourself in, especially in an international context? Yeah, I you, I have. And I, I think I've looked at it like chess, you know, so in leadership, there's 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 black, there's white and there's gray. And this is all the stuff that happens in the gray. And I'm a firm believer that um, being in these spaces, we have to learn how to win the gray and gray mm -hmm. is not like policy gray is not like you show up to the job at 7 59 and open your door at 8 a.m like we all know that stuff right but like the gray area stuff is i'm gonna have a meeting about something that people in this part of the world don't even talk about but it's happening how do i go into it and be effective with what i want to achieve not offend people, but not dumb myself down to the point where they don't really get the full, like, we need to talk about this, Yeah, you know? And so for me, I, I, I look at it like, I'm going to play chess here. And as long as I understand how you play chess and you're part of the world, I can still play chess the way we've learned how to play it in our in our blackness you know what yeah. i'm saying yeah um and so some and then sometime we use it i use it to my advantage i know that in our part of the world harmony is a huge huge deal so i go hey you know let me go in with some harmony but if that's not working i'm gonna go in and say hey look this needs to change immediately or this will be a problem and i i i know the demonstrative nature that i come across with changes the complexion of the room but i do it yeah. intentionally and so what i would offer is you know i'm gonna be black all the time but i'm gonna be black and playing chess to win just as much as i walk in you know and make sure that that i'm not thinking through like I, I had to turn turn myself down to the point where i wasn't like authentically black like yeah i'm i'm gonna walk in there and do it but but 
And it's not code switching because, you know, we learn codes, but it's not code switching. It's really cultural competence. Mm. You know what I mean? Yes. And, and, and our showing up black helps them become culturally competent, too, particularly here when it's a pretty homogenous society. Right. It, it's particularly especially where you work, you know, right. and, and the students that I've had. And I'm, I mean, I'm at Chinghua. Right. So so like I got to I got to tip my hat to who you are and what, what we do here, but also you're going to tip your hat to to what I have to say, because I'm not, I'm not going to dumb myself down to the point to make you feel better. Right. <laughs> Excuse me, which also means I'm not going to go in a meeting like, see, this is what y'all talking about. Blah, blah, because that ain't going to work. You know what I'm saying? You got to know the audience. But, <laughs> but the, I, I do think that there is a way that black people do things when we are articulate and we are well-informed and we stand on what we feel should happen one, and, and we have that mix of just stuff that God gave us. When all that comes together and we deliver that, there is somebody in the room that's going to respond to that. Yeah, they connect. You know, and so, yeah. And so for as much as we do have to modify our style and approach, um, I think that being authentic about how God has made us should be just as a part of that decision making process is is the technical kind of like this is the policy that was broken or we need to fix or the student said this or you know yeah so be black <laughs> phenomenally <laughs> yeah every day Listen, every day i appreciate that thought um i would like to ask you when you think of living abroad what has been or you know just traveling or whatever your experience has been what has been a defining moment of the time that you have spent outside of the U.S.? Oh, easy, two things easily. One is uh, understanding what, what what having resources looks like and what abject poverty looks like. Wow. You know, because being in the States, like, I mean, and we have places that, you know, are struggling for sure. Um, and because we're a, a consumer society and we're very materialistic and we just grow up wanting stuff, you know, I know folks that come from humble beginnings, but th they want a Mercedes and they gonna, they go like, the, or they want the stuff. And I didn't understand. I mean, I, I, I understand it because I'm American, but when I went to other places and I knew that like this person will never not sleep inside of a cardboard box. Like the likelihood that that's going to change for him or her is very slim. Wow. And I was like, this is abject poverty. Like this, this is way different than what I'm used to seeing, you know, yeah. back home, even in some of the worst of the worst situations, you know what I mean? And so just the, the, the disparity of resources and the lack of opportunity that can, that, that can uh, be in that scenario is is a huge lesson for me and the other one is you know and I think this is more recent over the since 2019 safety like I never I never knew that a place could be so safe and I oh you know God, like Beijing uh, but I yeah I, I just didn't know I was walking yeah. home one night in Suzhou and it wasn't late it was like eight o'clock but it was probably in the winter kind of dark and there's lights and stuff, but you know, you hit like a little stretch where it's kind of dark because of the trees or whatever. And usually yeah. back home, it's like, all right, let me make sure I know what's up and you know what's going on. And yeah. you know, somebody coming, let me make if they make a move. I got, you know, you think of all this stuff. And I was just walking down the street and it was dark and it was people just passing me and they weren't grabbing their purse. They weren't look, they didn't even look at me. They just kind of moving. And I was like, so people would ask me, what's the biggest adjustment to China? And I would say the biggest adjustment, and to your point, the lesson is that man, safety brings so much peace oh. that you can I can put up with a lot of other stuff that I didn't even realize I would put up with yeah because I was thinking about safety and all those other things became microaggressions for my angst that day or whatever but like it is safe and that's been the biggest thing you know my son he could run around on campus I get his little watch I'm like hey come home and I don't know where he is or what but I, it don't matter nobody's gonna he snatch him up nobody my wife is running around Shanghai and Beijing at all times of the day and night. And I'm like, she's good. And that is just a piece that I never knew existed. Wow. And so those two things. And then you go to places in the world where it just, it's not like that. You know, it's like, hey, make sure you wear your wallet on the, you know, on the front so you can tell, you know, like, you got to make sure. 
Exactly. So, so I think resources, resources, and then the, the notion of safety, you know, physical safety, mental, emotional, spiritual yeah. safety. Yeah, exactly. Have been two really big things for me, you know, in the in the international space that I've learn to learn to be attentive to you yeah. know when, whenever traveling or just kind of figuring out how we navigate this thing yeah I I love that um how do you to piggyback off of that so now you there's less of uh, energy expended on you know making a plan you know making you know, regarding safety and making sure you're home at this time and those things like that how do you redistribute that newfound I would say energy, understanding, awareness to live a more intentional life. I think it it has helped me be more present. Whereas, you know, being being in spaces where you had to focus on resources and focus on safety, like you just can't be, I couldn't be, let me own my own stuff. I couldn't be as present because I was there was always something swirling in my mind about let me make sure that. I get these bills paid, but in order to get these bills paid, I got to go to this meeting and deal with this, but you know, all these different things and then safety, like where my keys, where my car in Texas, you know, where's my gun? Does anybody yeah. have a gun? Like, you know, like all these different things. So going into, going into HEB is different when you walking in and you're like, is that something on his hip? Yeah, that's, yeah. Okay. All right. Let's just get in here, get these chips and get home, you know? Let's so it, it's it those now. things. Yeah. And so and so being being in a place where that's not that's not uh, that's not a part of the scenario. I think it really helps me um, be present, you know, at home, like when work is done, it's done. I'm not I have a new job now. So I'm in the first six months is real hectic. But like I'm not taking work home. I'm not as worried when my son's like, come here, let me show you this. I'm like, cool. I'm into it. I'm not like yeah. I'm hurry up so I can get to the, you know, something I need to handle like it really yeah. takes away those barriers to being present yeah being present showing up being able to be mindful of how you're connecting with you know those closest to you I can only imagine like the benefits that you've been able to reap you know family wise mental health wise physical mm -hmm. health wise since being I wouldn't say a slower pace just being able to exist is it exist or live what word would you use differently I, you know i would say this to being able to understand and walk in what it means to thrive oh yeah rather than yeah or thrive more than we survive because i don't yeah. you know it, the race but like, is different i really feel like black people going abroad is like taking I don't know if it's the red or blue pill in the matrix where you're out of and you're like yo I can really save money I can really get out of debt? what I, I, like how this is possible how come I wasn't on this 15 years ago you know and so I would say for any black person listening to this if you get a chance to get abroad to do anything the types of opportunities and and packages that come with that will change your life forever yeah. and our communities are, are we're used to what we're used to and yeah you're gonna miss some thanksgivings and christmas is at home but over the longevity of your life you know there there's some phenomenal benefits to this that i think you know we need to really latch on to and it's hard to explain right Kendall? i know yeah. i'm pretty sure you call home and, and they like girl you doing all this and you're doing all that and you're like when yeah, you coming right? home <laughs> And, and you ain't thinking like, I want to, this is pre-COVID, like, I want to come visit, but I don't want to come stay, you know, like, I'm. y'all can have all of that. I'll take the challenges that come with this, but like, it is, it is, I think it's the thriving piece. Like, yeah. we get to thrive more rather than survive, for sure. Yeah, for sure. I know, like, when COVID hit and I was stranded at home for nine months, oh, my goodness. It was one of the hardest, you know, parts of my life and I and I love my parents you know love my family yeah. but there is just a level of peace with the freedom to move when you want to hop on a plane go somewhere 
be in a new space, engulf yourself in a new culture, all of your own design and decision. And to for that to be stripped away, I know was really difficult. Um, but you know, we thrive, we survive, we 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 make it through challenging things. I think one of the byproducts of having to endure so much is that we survive. Um, That's right. But I want us to be able to thrive with abundance and learn i think there's these new words around you know living a soft life which i don't Mm -hmm. fully understand but i know that i want us to be able to experience life that feels easier life that feels more aligned with you know the type of existence that we want to have and that we want to pass on um to our progeny our family other people that we Mm -hmm. love um and I'm just so grateful that you all can give, it's Khalil, right? Your yeah, son yeah. can give Khalil that gift of exposure to expand. Um, yeah. It's amazing. So when you think of, if you were to be able to, I know this kind of tip touches on what you just shared as far as a message to give people. If you were to, you know, like college students that you work with specifically, talk to them about, moving abroad and having that discussion of like individuation from family and going to live independently, what would that sound like? Um, is this for people of color, like, like college students of color or would they be non- different They would, they would. Either, whichever you prefer. So if it was somebody black from Huntsville who was super smart and had opportunities and they could you know, work abroad or work, I would say go abroad um, because you will find black people wherever you are. If you want to be around some black folks, you will find them. Um, we are all over the world. Uh, yes, you will miss, if you don't get to travel back home as much as you want to, yes, you will miss that, but you will be able to grow and expand and touch people's lives in ways that you never would if you stayed in Lacey, Washington or Huntsville, Yeah, you know, um, and you'll be able to, it, it'll be affordable to go see other parts of the world. Yeah. Um, and so I would say, take advantage of that while you can and save some money because you can save some money, you can pay off debt, you can do all those things and it won't feel as difficult as it probably will if you stay in the United States yeah. because you have to do all of the regular living stuff on top of being black. Yeah. Which Oops. is hard, yeah. you know, and yeah, being, being black abroad is not perfect. No. You know, cause when people are like, how is it? I'm like, it's good. And I think they hear it's perfect. I'm like, no, it's not perfect, but it's good, you know, in ways that in liberating in ways that I never even thought was possible. Yeah. I mean, just, Growing up in the States, I never thought it was possible, you know, and so and vacations don't really count because you go out of town and have a good time. So, of course, it's going to be, you know, Jamaica's amazing and blah, blah, blah. Right. It, well, we went to all the spots, you know, right. but when you live abroad, um, I just think that if you really want to get to know yourself and appreciate what you have, where you come from, what you could achieve. I honestly believe living outside of your context helps you accelerate your thought process about those things because you have to facilitate it in somebody else's context, which I think I've always liked that when I live in Texas. You know, one reason why I love to live in Texas was because black people and white people had to concede to Mexican people like Texas has a huge influence imprint of Mexican culture so like the white dude can't fight with the you know black sister too much because Mexicans really like have an imprint so we have to make sure that we are navigating all these things and we don't just focus on each other and I and I liken that to being outside of the of the country like you know in an international context like if you live anywhere in the world you got to really kind of dial into how they do things there which takes the focus off of all of the angst that you would point at at something that became commonplace back home yeah I, and, and to add to that choosing because we don't most of us aren't forced to move abroad well True. right choosing to be an expat is an exercise in release of control 
Mm -hmm. and embracing the uncertainty and unknown of life. Because when you move abroad to, you know, other countries and you become a guest in their in their home, your way of doing things, seeing things is no longer prioritized. And so I definitely believe it is it's a it's an it's a master class in adaptability and flexibility. And are you open to cultural awareness? And I'm wondering, mm-hmm. like, what 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 are some ways that you feel you've had to adapt thinking, existing, working when it comes to living internationally? In China or just, well, I guess because it's only, yeah, this is the only place I've lived internationally. Yeah. Um, I think I've had to, like, like Asian culture is not altogether unfamiliar for me because I grew in Washington state, like, it's like a huge melting yeah. pot, particularly, particularly of Asian cultures. So I grew up with Korean folks and Chinese folks and, you know, Cambodians and like it, and, and then biracial kids, you know, so there were like a ton of, of different cultures up there. So coming to this part of the world, it wasn't like, I, I don't know, I don't know anything about anybody Asian, you know, <laughs> yeah. it wasn't that. Um, but but I think that what I've had to learn is you have to really, I, I'm, I'm real big on values. You know, I think if people understand their values, then you you know why they're navigating life the way they do. And so for me, the number one thing that I had to be, I have to be attentive to is what do these people value? Not what decision they're going to make or what like, okay, so what's the value? If harmony is a value, then that's why we're not going to fight in meetings. But just because we don't fight in meetings doesn't mean that when they say yes, it's a yes. Right. That might not be the case. You know, it's just harmony. They don't want to fight. They don't want no smoke. And we, and I come from a place where we want all the smoke. So we I got to figure and this we'll thing it. out. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So so I, I think for me, it's been understanding what people value. And then I, 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 it helps me focus less on the what happens. It I, I want to get to the why and the who. Like, who is this person? Why are you doing this? And then the what is like, oh, it's a combination of those two things, right. you know? So so if I could get to, if and if I can get them to understand what I value, then when we sit down, and particularly in this part of the world, away from other people, because face is a very high value, then I can have a conversation and go, hey, look, check this out. Like, I know why you're making that decision. Here's why I want to make this decision. So how can we best work together to make sure we both win in this? Because no, that losing is not the, you know, nobody wants to lose. Right. And there has to be some culture. The other thing too is, is I've had to learn cultural humility. Like I can critique mm-hmm. some things about China that I just don't care for, but I also have to be humble and mindful enough to know that it's providing something for my family that I didn't get for the 40 something years I was back home. So mm-hmm. I can't, I can't be, I can't bash, you know, the, the, the place too much. You know, not, not can't even bash it at all. I can critique it, but I can't bash it because yeah. then I'll have to look at, you know, all of the stuff that is provided for me and I'd be hypocritical if I did that. So, you know, just, you just got to be aware of what they value and, and, and what it's doing for your life. And then just be a good steward of that. Yeah. I'm and when really- you're not recognize it. Exactly. And, and I would imagine do something to change it. Right. It's all about what, what I say a lot, you know, the clients and things is noticing you know, shifts and how are you then relating to those things that you notice? You know, are you are you aligned with whatever value that holds for you? And are you moving in a way that really speaks to the person that you are? And if not, you know, how do you make that adjustment? So yeah. the, the, the part about, you know, really respecting the life-changing opportunities that have come out of being here. There's been so much like personal growth and shifting and and for me, like business growth, just from, you know, being on the other side of the world that I would have never, well, I don't even know if never, it wouldn't have come to me as quickly had I been back home. And on those days where I'm just like, I'm over China, I then have to remind myself, it's part of the strategy. You were gifted the opportunity. Somebody saw something enough in you for to give you this idea, come abroad. And every time, like I've had, this is my third school. I've not mm-hmm. looked for a job 
period. Mm -hmm. There have been people that have been like, this would be perfect for you. This is an opportunity. Go seek it. And I'm like, I know that's God's alignment on the days. Right. When I'm, why am I still here? Why is it so hard? Why, 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 why? And then it's just like, but remember what I've told you and look at all the things that have been birthed out of this patch of difficulty that leads to so much other opportunity and meeting of good people. And how do you feel when you have those realizations of like, oh, okay, I get it. That's why. Oh, I, I firmly believe that things happen to us, but they don't happen for us. They happen for, you know, for us to, you know, kind of kind of stash away until we have to bring those things up to help somebody else. It sounds corny, but I really believe that um, I'm a cancer survivor. And mm -hmm. so I had colon cancer in 2014. Wow. And the moment that the doctor said I had cancer, I was like, whoa, wow. you know, I'm, I'm in this community now. What does this mean? It, like, what's going on? And shortly after, my wife can attest, shortly after that, and I don't mean like a few days, I mean like a few hours, I was like, I'm not going to die from this. Mm. Like God, God chose me for this, right? He chose us to be black expats. And that doesn't mean that every day is going to be a great day where you're like, oh my God, it's, you know, but you were chosen for this. And so now how do you, you know, one, give him the glory for it, two, steward it the right way, and three, help somebody else understand, you know, their journey better. And so I think that the that part of, you know, looking at, and you, you'll understand a bad China day, right? It could be, you go to the supermarket, your, your Wi-Fi ain't working, your WeChat's not working, your Google Translate is going bad, or the, you know, like, there's yeah. a number of things here that should take about 20 <laughs> minutes, that could take six hours, and you're like, you know, I just want to get into bed, I, I can't, I can't even do anything today, right, my, my, I'm over it, my vibe is off, everybody's under my skin, and it's just, the day like it was nobody yeah. did anything to you it's just um, a difficult day yeah but then again I I lay in my bed and I go yeah but I'm in a dope apartment though like all right I can start over tomorrow <sighs> all right man yeah. you know so, yeah. so I think it, again it's not perfect but it is definitely it definitely gives us you know um an opportunity to reflect in what I'll tell you people can say that they reflect in all this stuff in the States all they want to. And I'm making a huge overgeneralization, but I'm thinking, no, you're not. You're, you're just taking pockets of time to think about stuff. But mm -hmm. I've learned, this is another thing I've learned being an expat, uh, not even a black, just an expat, any, just about anything we want to achieve working in the international space can allow you to have time and opportunity to do that. Yeah. Entrepreneurship. I'm, I, you know, I produce music, like, producing music for blah 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 anytime I don't do it I'm like Raphael you're just not taking the time because in the states I was like man if I just had time to or you know it was there was stuff that was going on and that stuff is real but yeah. when I got over here I was like man I got a four-hour block of time I could I can really lean into this project or I can so it takes away all of the excuses too which I think is beautiful um particularly for folks that work in education because back home educators get paid nothing and they have to be doctors and lawyers and counselors Everything. and teachers, you know, security guards and all of this stuff just to get through a day. Yeah. But you come here, I think they really, I really appreciated seeing teachers and counselors and people, particularly in the K-12 setting yeah. that were like thriving and living and they seem happy to do their job. And I was like, I know some great teachers. They're not happy to go to work every day, you know, and this is in a suburban school or a hood yeah. school. They knew it was tough. But here I've been like, yo, it's really dope to see what international education does to the psyche of a teacher or a counselor, because you just don't have the same uh, barriers. Yeah. They're different, ones, but they're just not the same that we're used to. And I think that that can really help the mental, emotional health of folks doing this work in, in, a, in this context. Yeah, reducing burnout is is one of the most important things to help an educator, right? And I talk about this all the time in the in the schools that I've worked in in my current school. It is how to, how are we looking at the systems that we are existing in every day to help people 
thrive more, have more work mm-hmm. satisfaction and feel good about what they're doing. I know so many people that I've talked about, okay, oh, have you thought about moving abroad? And it's, and it's, it's, it's one getting over the fear of the unknown. And is that for me? And I wore this shirt worthy on purpose. Yes, it is. Yes. You know, I would have never thought, I'm sure other people or you would have never thought that, is that a life that I can have? But it, it, they are the opportunities abound everywhere. Um, I really want to touch on, well, we've touched on a lot already, but I definitely want to dig into this mental health conversation. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just, just you alluded to it. When you think of the term mental health, how would you define it for yourself? I think mental, the, the, that is a great question. I actually thought about that a little bit and I didn't, I never came to like, what's my definition of it? Um, because it just goes in so many different directions. But I guess if I had to like crystallize it or capture it, I think mental health is being emotionally, you know, psychologically, emotionally and psychologically um and intellectually uh healthy and when i say healthy it means in a better space than not most of the time because i don't I, like we can say opt- i always try to say i want optimal physical mental spiritual health optimal does not mean 100% of the time i'm just flying high right. but i want to be in that that higher tier of it more than i'm down here right. and i need to figure out the things that run me lower than I need to be, because for me, that's that's when I feel like my mental health is compromised when either internally there's things that just come prepacked with Raphael that can send me into that lower register of of, you know, mental health or when there's external factors that send me into that lower register. Um, so I just think it's trying to be op- in an optimal space where you can actually be the best version of yourself psychologically and emotionally. Um, and intellectually as well. Um, and and to do that, I think that it takes a lot of, there's some thing, factors we can control and then there's some things that we will always grapple with. But that's where I think getting counselors and therapists and confidants and people that can really pour into our lives is real. Um, and, and contrary to popular belief, I think that that the Black community has always had people that tried to do that for somebody else but they weren't given the official therapist counselor title once that title came into play i think that's when black folks are like ain't nothing wrong with me well <laughs> right yeah there is because we've been talking to you know our uncle about this thing for the past 10 years and he's been trying to you know help us through it or she's been trying to make sure she navigated the system through whatever so I, I, but sometimes when we put official titles on things, it makes it real. When we're just having a conversation, like I just need to go by Uncle Joe's house real quick and holler at him about something. That's getting counseling. Yeah, go sit and tinker uh-huh. on the truck, sit on the porch, yeah, go to the backyard. Mm-hmm. Yeah, or, or you know, like, look, girl, let me go talk to him. Just sit. I'll, I'll be right back. Let me go. <laughs> what coming? What, what? What? What's good? You know, like so. Exactly. So I think I think counseling and and discussion about whatever is going on has always happened i think now we've but i it, i think that it is more complicated in past generations than it is now because the person who was counseling whoever needed it was going through tremendous strain and stress themselves and particularly in our communities i can't even imagine what it looked like from the I mean, from the inception of the United States, for sure. But just think of like from the 1920s to the 1970s, that 50 year period of time, like black people Era. went through some stuff. And so I'm supposed to be your mentor when I got this going on and I, I'm trying to I'm trying to go to university. But a couple, you know, you know, uh, miles up the road, they still lynching people like I, like, you know, like all these different dynamics. So. I, but now I think from seven, you know the eighties certainly through through now there's been strides, but the titles are the things that I think make the stigma much bigger. But I've just changed my my whole thought on. I've been asking people to help me out my whole life, and that's counseling, right? You know, 
Not, right. They just they just didn't go to school for it and whatever. They just it was lived experience rather than right. lived experience with with you know training and knowledge. But you know, and I think everybody needs that. Everybody could benefit from sitting on the couch with somebody who, by law, can't tell your business so you can get your business situated. <laughs> I, I don't Ethical. see what the big a foundation yes. of ethics. Yes. Um, you said a whole mouthful, like I'll just go with the part where in our community, especially because that's the only one I can speak for, there's always been that wise counsel, right? There's always been that person that you trust that you know is leading with love, even if the message hurts, pricks a bit. And there's, for, mo for the most part, there's always been those systems and foundations of support in many different arenas. And, and I agree with you once things began to get more pathologized and you have white supremacy and all those other things interjected into what healing looks like and then what is abnormal, um, then there's that distrust of this system. Um, and, and that is one of the reasons, like my mother's a counselor, my mother's a retired counselor, educator. And that was one of the reasons that I was like, no, this is, there's a slogan from a, um, a, a group that I follow, Melanin and Mental Health in Houston, lovely women. Mm. And they have a slogan, you know, changing the face of therapy on the couch, you know, on both sides of the couch. That's the mm -hmm. emphasis because we need the support. We carry generations of trauma um, in our bodies and in our experiences. And it shows up when an alcoholism you know, substance abuse, so many other things, depression for sure. And we take that with us as expats, right? Oh, A yeah. lot of people yeah. that I've talked to have decided I'm leaving because I can't handle the mental strain of being wanting to thrive as a Black person in America. And I'm not afforded that opportunity, no matter what I do. But then you go yeah. to another country. I've asked people a lot. So what is, what's the motivation? Are you running from something or are you running toward something? Yeah. What's the distinction? Yeah. That's critical. That's critical. Yeah. Because it's not mm. like, it's not like the, the issues go away. They're still there. Right now you got to deal with them in a different country. And if you don't know how to navigate that, that can be, you know, detrimental. And if you yeah. have the appropriate resources to fend your way through a system that's foreign to you and stay connected to your support, then you can have, you know, so many great benefits um, and, and live a healthier life. So I, when you think about being abroad, you know, or even traveling or things, like what were some of the major um and we're still going to, you know, be talking about mental health, right? Mm -hmm. well, this is the question I want to ask. When has living abroad impacted your your mental health in any type of way? Oh, for sure, in a in a in a much better way. Um, and, and my physical health. I truly believe coming abroad has put years back onto my life because education in the states, although it's it's a it's an admirable you know field and everybody's like you know Kendall's a counselor she helping them kids and da -da -da. they don't understand what you got to go through to do all of that <laughs> and in and, and the same in in every context I've worked in um and I've worked in a few it, it, they don't they don't understand what we have to navigate in coming out here I don't have to deal with a lot of that stuff yeah I, like I don't have to deal with shootings and, you know, sexual assault and alcohol culture and fraternities and sororities and all kind of, you know, big time athletics and all that stuff is great when I was a, well, not all of it was great, but the things about being a student at a university that just kind of is like what you remember, yeah. I'm the person where that, that falls on my desk, you know, when it goes wrong. And so I just, being in this context and not have an education is so much different out here than that. I don't have those headaches, which means I can show up better for my family, for myself, for my friends, you know, to explore other interests. Um, and I think, you know, it's I'm I'm much better in the international setting than I have ever been in the States working, you know, uh, working in, in the traditional context of higher education. I never plan on working on a U.S. college campus ever again. Oh, wow. Never. I've said that. I've said the same thing. Can't do yeah. it. 
I, I, I could I, I wouldn't even be effective. I don't even think I would be as effective going back and dealing with that because then I would have to, you know, like the rep repatriation process is already That's hard, but you got to do that. You got to do that vocationally too. So you got to go, oh, this, yeah, this is what the job is. What am I doing? <laughs> I'm coming back to this. I forget, yeah, yeah, I forgot it was even like this. Like, why would yeah. I even do that? So, which, which again, impacts who you are when you drive off the parking lot, you know? And so I just don't want to ever go back to that uh, in, in the same context. And so it, it has helped me mentally and emotionally, spiritually, um, in ways that I think have been positive. And then when I, and when I do struggle, I can actually sit with that struggle mm. and go, okay, so what are you going to do to do something about this? Because there's just not as much noise in the international space. And that you, you understand how like people, people will have to come over here and really experience that for a stretch of time, but there's just not as much noise. You can kind of quiet everything and think through like, all right, what is work? How can I get optimal again if I'm not there and stay out of that lower register? Yeah. And I think a lot of people operate in deficit back home and they just have become accustomed to it. Uh, but I would argue that they, it, it would help their mental. Once you, if you can get over, this ain't like back home. No, it's not. It's not supposed to be. <laughs> and, and, yeah, and be grateful that it's not like, yes. I want, I, I want some collard greens for Thanksgiving. Thanks, it's November. I want some. I do. I want I want some with vinegar and I want some catfish and I want some candy yams with marshmallows on them, like That's how my dad it. makes it. There, it's, I will not get that in, in the same way. No. Yeah. But I also don't have to deal with walking down the street thinking that somebody's going to harm my son, myself, or my mom simply because we're Black. And so there's trade-offs to it, yeah. but I think that these trade-offs have helped me really mentally and emotionally conceptualize what being in a good space is like. Even when I'm not, I I feel like I can get there. Maybe I don't know if quicker, but, but I can get there. I see it yeah. back home sometimes. I don't think people can see it. Sometimes I couldn't see it. I was just like, man, I just got to ride this, yeah, ride this out, you know, and yeah. and you just keep again get into that lower register yeah i hear what you said is the pathway is clear it's not as yeah right yeah. by all the external things that we don't have any control over and you know again choosing to come abroad it kind of filters out like you said the noise and the other distractions that make things very difficult to show up and so i yeah. What you're doing right now is what I would call an exercise of vulnerability. Because mm. um, this isn't easy for everyone to share their experience in this story, and I'm always very grateful. So I'm wondering, and especially in the context of being a Black man, when you hear the word vulnerability, how, mm -hmm. can, how does one see that as a gift and a strength? Um, so I grew up in a family of men that had that have no problem crying at all mm. or kissing each other on the cheek and saying, I love you. I see you tomorrow. Or I see you next summer. I see like and it was just it was just who we are. You know, my grandfather wasn't like that as much like he was affectionate, but he was like, sit on your papa's lap. Hey, man, you got a girlfriend. You know, well, what's your girlfriend's name? You know, wise counsel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I don't know if the council was always wise, but you know, he, <laughs> but you, but, but, but it, he wasn't like the, you know, like pat you on your shoulder, hey, boy, how you doing? And then like drifted into a room that I never saw him. And he was very yeah. present. Um, and so, you know, like my, my biological father, my stepdad, both great men, neither one of them, they will cry if they feel like it and they won't apologize for it or anything like that. And so, I didn't grow up in a house where I felt like I had to be, you know, hyper masculine. They were definitely what, you know, whatever version of a men's men you want to, you know, we can characterize yeah. that. I think I'm saying that in the most healthy way, yeah. but they, you know, they would cry. They would tell each other, you know, they, 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 all of the men, my uncles, my cousins, all of us, we say, I love you. And we'll look each other in the eye and say it, not like the, I love you dog. All right. I holler at you. you know, like, nah, we don't got to put any of the stuff to make it feel but much more comfortable. Yeah. It's like, man, I love you. I'll talk to you tomorrow, you know? And so I think that that was empowering. Um, and so that, 
I think the actions showed me what vulnerability looks like more than or or if something went down they'd be like you know what I'm sorry that's my bad mm. that's on me like I blew it I'm and you know and and I think I learned that from my stepdad who is a preacher and he's been in my life since I was seven so like we're really close and he would seeing seeing a black man who was trying to do the best for his family who was also a preacher dealing with all of the you know, everything that he felt like God called him to do and just the complexity of dealing with church folks and all of that for him to, to for me to live in a house where I saw him go, no, that's on me. Like the reason why that went wrong is because I messed that up. Yeah. So yeah, preacher and all that aside, like that's on me, Raphael. And that just showed me like, dang, this dude ain't scared to tell me that he messed up. Um, And because he don't know if I'm going to go and tell my friends that he messed up, if I'm mad at him, like he he's taking that risk, you know? And so I think that I feel like for me, I don't have a problem being, being vulnerable with the people who will honor that. Cause I've seen that even my, you know, my closest male friends, you know, we, we, I I had that, I, I grew up with them in, in, in high school um, and some of the middle school and then we all went to college together. So, you know, I've been able to have a long run with them and we've been up, we've been down, we've been whatever, but like those three guys, we, we will say, I love you. We will say, that's my bad. We will say, you know, when we were in school, but that wasn't cool. When you are we're we going to go hoop, you know? And so I just think, I think it helps us really have a soft place to land, mm. honestly, in places with men that, nobody else can facilitate or replace because I think a lot of men try to find a soft place to land in women. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that comes out as hypersexual or, or sexual. And it's like, nah, man, you just need comfort. Or I, if a woman tells a man she loves him, feels great. But whether they, they're in, they just kicking it or they really into it or not, it feels really good. But when two men can say, I love you, that it does hit different. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. In a way where it's like, I care about you and I know what you go through and I know nobody else is giving you no passes for it. And they can't even explain what you go through to get through the day. I love you, bro. Wow. That is priceless. And I really feel bad for brothers that don't have that because the world is cold for a lot of us. Yeah. And then the decisions that we make can make it much harder. So I think being vulnerable, even in our jobs, I think, you know, you, you have to, I would argue that when you're climbing and you're trying to, you know, get to wherever success looks like, it's hard to be vulnerable because people are judging us, yeah. you know, particularly black folks. So we like, I gotta, I gotta be competent, but I gotta be personable. I gotta be, you know, I can't be too like cool because they're going to think I'm too informal, but I can't be the, you know, the super square. Like I, all I talk about is the work because I look a little too starched up, you right. know, whatever. So it's just all these things. And so I think that when you get to a place where you know, I'm going to be employed, I'm employable, period. And you're com comfortable in that. I can show up and be uh, 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 authentic, vulnerable to a degree, and also, what's the word I'm looking for? Like, infallible like I don't have to show up and be like a administrative robot that's not wrong if I'm wrong you say that's my bad I made a bad call so you know well that's on me yeah you know because yeah. I think it makes people see us as people rather than just Kendall the counselor or yeah. Raphael the administrator or so and so the blah 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 when you say look I just don't have it today Human I just I'm going home. yeah I'm going exactly exactly I'm going home so I think the vulnerability can be used as a sword and shield um, if people are comfortable in their skin, uh, knowing how that plays out in the whole kind of context of, of who they are, what they need to accomplish, and that some people won't steward that the right way. But, you know, yeah, I think the most powerful words that have to do with vulnerability are, I love you. Can you help me? Thank you. I need you. Do you need me? Like those phrases open us up because people can trample on those, right? 
but it's not about necessarily what people are going to do. It's about how we show up in those spaces so that people know who who we are and the content of our character. Yeah. But it takes a lot to go, all right, I'm going I'm to put this out here and yeah. you have to be prepared for folks not to reciprocate that. But vulnerability yeah. is not about what's reciprocated. It's about you putting your you know, self out there in ways that you're comfortable with. Yeah. I, 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 so many seeds planted in what you just shared. And I, I, I want to request if you can, ex as, as a man raising, as a black man raising a black child, right. You know, a beautiful black family. We have families abroad, even back home that mm -hmm. are teetering on how do I show up? I don't even believe in the whole better or worse. How do I show up healthier? Mm -hmm. How do I show up differently um, as the lead of my family? And if you were to give any type of advice or words of wisdom to other Black men that might be watching this, because they do, um, expat fathers, or whatnot, like what would be some salient things that you would say that you think could kind of help usher them in a different path? Um, be present with your kids, for your kids. Um, in ways where they'll look back and go, you know, my dad was there. Uh, I can tell my son a lot of stuff, but when I do something, that's when I can see something different in his eyes. Like, oh, no, no, no. He's really in it now with me, you know? And so I'll like, even, even because I want to try to model for him um, what, what healthy vulnerability and uh, emotions are with men. And so when I hug him, most of the time, I don't hug him from a standing up position. I get on my knees because he's shorter than me right now. I get on my knees so he can like lean into it and I'm on his level. Um, and from what I've observed, that really helps him. Like you know, he literally leans on me rather than he's like up trying to, because I just, I, I think that there's power in posture mm. with him. Um, so just be present with your kids. Make sure that they know um, the pressures that we're under. I tell them, like, son, I like I had a really long day. I can't do that right now. I promise tomorrow or on Monday I'll do. And then you just, you know, make sure that you follow through on that. Right. Um, but don't try to hide your own pressures or uh, low energy or whatever. Like, because they need to know. Because he will be a man one day. I'm not raising a kid in my mind. I'm raising a man. So he's going to be, he's nine now, but he's going to be 19, you know, in 10 years. So I got 10 more summers with him until he's on mm -hmm. somebody's campus and going to be somebody's husband or, you know, whatever. So I'm like, I I'm, I have to, I, I need for him to draw on what he saw rather than what he heard. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think with our, you know, partners, um, I, it's different being in a space where, you have the option of do you want to work or do you not want to work? Um, and I and we we are, are blessed to be in that position. Um, I think that for if I was given a man who was in my position any advice, I would say the choice should be hers. If she wants to, let her do it. If she doesn't want to, then make sure you bring it in this bread, you're saving it and making sure that their quality of life is good. Yeah. Um, but what I've learned is there is a, a a shift in mentality that I will say that my wife, we we and neither one of us probably even thought that it would be a factor of like we've had to work. But what is it like to look at not having to work right now? And and you can pivot into an industry or having the flexibility to do that. But then also, kind of what does value look like? You know, from because I know, like, I got to go out there. I got to bring this money in. That's that's not the only thing I need to do, but that's I take that on my shoulders. You know, I'm patriarchal to a large degree, and I and I hope it's as healthy as it can be. But I I I love I like providing that opportunity so my family can live a certain quality of life. Um, 
But I also have I've had to learn what it looks like with my wife to have to process what that looks like when she's been conditioned like all of us to go out there and work and your contribution is financial too. But when it's not, I think that we need to be attentive to what that's that thought process, those emotions look like and not just be like, what you what you worry about? Like, what's the problem? You know, like that that's completely uh antithetical to to what I think is is healthy. Um and so, and then I just think personally, put yourself in a position to make sure your family can see more so they can do more. My son the other day, <clears throat> I didn't even, so you have these nuggets that pop out that I didn't even realize, Kendall. So, you know, he's around all these kids and, and or students in, um, in Schwarzman College, 143 of them, they're from all over the world, they're super smart, blah, 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 blah. Uh -huh. Yeah. And he, and he, uh, somebody asked about college and he was like, yeah, I'm going to go to Harvard or, or Oxford. Now, I know that he doesn't really know what Harvard or Oxford looks like, yeah. but the bar has been set really high. Yeah. And I was like, there's a bar. And I didn't even know what Harvard or Oxford looked like in college. You know, I, you know, I, I went to Washington <laughs> State and it was it was six hours away from my parents and it was all good. You know, so so. But just but just what you can expose your kids to while keeping them grounded in the principles, you know, spiritually, you know, values, values wise, trying to keep them modeling those things. And then I think the third thing that is is across the board for, you know, your partner, your kids or people in your life is just being humble enough to say, you know what, I don't know it or I'm sorry I did it or I need your help because pride comes before the fall and you can't get too prideful on like I'm I've arrived like I never try to I haven't arrived my wife knows that she like take the trash out she don't care like if you know I've spoken we to all got a, chores a, around you know, it, yeah yeah like I could I could do a talk to 10,000 people and she'd be like yeah that was dope all right but this trash need to go out I'm like I'll just get this trash you know so so you gotta you gotta you know do the you gotta put yourself in a position to yeah. to remain humble about what happens because <clears throat> you know, it's it's not ours in the first place. It's uh just an experience that God has given us to steward, and we should steward that experience to the best of our ability until the next one comes along. Oh my goodness. I'm just gonna say yes, you know, to everything. I have just a few more questions. I know this is random yeah, yeah. than anticipated, but it's just so so good. When you think of like I hear, you know, the the family structure and really just reorienting the way that you know, you're perceiving what leadership and power and love and all those things look like and example. And so when you, I'm still on the whole mental health thing, right? When you think about mm -hmm. messages passed down to you about what mental health is, what it looks like, and at your present space, your understanding of it, how do you think what you've learned and what you teach regarding mental wellness has shifted? Um, I, I don't think that I learned growing, I, I don't think it was articulated to me growing up what mental wellness should look like. Like nobody sat down and said, okay, so here's how you stay out of your, your lower register and try to stay in your <laughs> higher register. You know? yeah. Um, it was, it was about like, don't get in trouble, you know, stay safe in church. Yeah. And, and you know stay around them fools over there doing dumb stuff don't get you know like so it was more or less guiding the path than yeah. you know psychologically or emotionally kind of kind of making sure I was uh, you know in an optimal space um uh, but I, so so that's what I would say is that I try to I do remember times when um I would have conversations with my dads and my moms and they would say well, what do you think about that how does that make you feel you know, when, when so-and-so did that, well, I didn't like that because I, okay, so what, why don't you like it? Because, so I had to really talk through like why I felt the way I felt, you know? And so I think those conversations, I, I remember a lot of those. Um, but I think now I have the vernacular and really the privilege to look online, you know, or, or be connected to a counselor to get more game on, what I can articulate than what they did, because right. again, 
how many people were counselors in the 70s and 80s when our parents were young folks going through whatever they're going through. They relied on whoever they felt like they trusted, whoever they felt like they could talk to at church. Yeah. And, you know, that was really it, you know. And so you and you weren't going to pay to go talk to somebody about your problem. That didn't even make sense in our in our community. So, right. you know, so I think that they they had a different way of doing it. But now I think I just have the benefit of growing up in this kind of span of life where, you know, I'm 45. And I really think that my generation is a unique one. Everybody thinks that, right? Like my dad is like, y'all music wasn't like our music. And I'm like, I like that, you know. But but I think we're really unique because we can we sit at the intersection of, you know, the the folks from the 40s, 50s to <clears throat> the the 70s and then from 70 into the, you know, to the 2000s. And there's been a whole lot of change. And so yeah. we can look back and grab what we feel is the the better parts of kind of whatever somebody would deem old school. But then we can look at the newer stuff and technology and infra access to information and really living in a culture of where mental health is a is a huge is a word that you hear daily if you're in yeah. you know a lot of times weekly you know um, and and I think that I just have the privilege of drawing on the the adversity strength that they had in the past and reaching into the empathy that is now a part of the culture, you know, in, in the now and in the future. Yeah. So I just try to really try to marry the two. Yeah. And they don't know that sometimes they collide, you know, cause I'll, I'll tell my son in a minute, stop whining, you know, and that is definitely my uncles, my dad and all of them. Cause I'm like, and I'm like, maybe I didn't should have said like that. Okay. Yeah. It's not like, you don't need to worry about that because you know. So I try to I try to clean. I try to do a clean little bit of both. Sometimes you yeah. know, it, you you you. I just try to draw from the stuff from the past that I think is 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 meaningful, and the stuff now that I think again I just have access to it. And why wouldn't I do? There ain't no parenting books in the eighties, you know. Now there, you know, or dating or whatever. Like people can have access to information where at least you get some tools. You don't got to use yeah. them all, but you get some. They were figuring it out. Yeah, and, and, they were. And I'm more empathetic to my mom's generation, my grandfather's generation, and the generation before them because I think like I'm 45 and I look and I was like, wait, they were 45 and they're just people like me trying to figure yeah. out. Okay, trying to make it day by day, day by day. Well, you know, Man. saying that a lot of that is like compounding stress and responsibility and fear and yada 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 so I want to ask you this question what does healing and rest look like to you rest looks like rest like rest looks like doing nothing and enjoying every bit of it mm. and I love it and and sometimes rest so so rest to me looks like not doing anything. I can sit at home and and I'm I feel like I'm relatively extroverted, but I could stay home in a heartbeat and and for a whole day, or for three or four days, and be like, yeah, I ain't. I order some food, I'm good, and ain't nobody around me, I'm okay. Um, and so rest, I think rest is necessary. Rest is biblical, from my worldview. Um, so I think that that people shouldn't be they shouldn't feel like they need to martyr themselves for everything that's going on in their life and run themselves run run themselves lower than they need to be um and but we have to have boundaries to to be attentive to that yeah and, but, but the but the the catch 22 is there's so many things that are going to try to tread on those boundaries that you're constantly trying to go all right that's a that's enough right yeah. okay, you got to yeah. keep you know you're yeah. getting too close you know so um, I think rest is necessary. And if you, if we're not rested, it's just like sleep. If you're too sleepy, you shouldn't drive. If you're too sleepy, you not you shouldn't do your, the report or you shouldn't try to counsel. You, I shouldn't be trying to do, you know, something, the, the annual, you know, review for my job because I'm going to mess it up, right? Um, so that's just, rest is necessary. And then what was the, what was the first? It was rest and what? Healing. Healing. Um healing is not for whoever offended or hurt me mm -hmm. in my mind 
Can you say that again for those that are listening or will be yeah, listening? Not, it, healing is not like a, a, a tool for vindication, mm. you know, from something that somebody did. It's really an internal mechanism or it, it, like healing like is an internal you know, mending that needs to happen or reconciliation of something that is unresolved in us for whatever reason. And healing comes by, hey, I need to talk to you about this. I did this. And, you know, to heal others. And then sometime that conversation is a, I need to, you know, be whole, but somebody needs to talk to me or I need to reconcile situation to become whole myself, despite how, that happens. And I've had, there's been two people um, that I can say that I, I, I've i held something against. I don't, not anymore, but I've, I've reconciled it and, and really got some healing from it. But the situations went in two different directions. One person, you know, I was like, I don't mess with you. And, and the person I felt slighted me at some point in my career. And when I saw that person, you know, they, they were like, Yep, you should have been grateful that I helped you. And I was like, Negro, you didn't help me. You know, so it was really contentious. And I was like, what? And then one of my mentors was there and he said, hey, you need to go over there and get this right with him. And I'm thinking, what do I need to get it right for? I ain't do it. He did it. And he said, yeah, but it's 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 not reconciled in you. You need to get this off of your chest. Mm, mm, mm. And I was like, <sighs> Ooh, you baby, know, that extra so humility going, is something else, oh, baby. Man. Oh, that I, I didn't feel like I was winning in that moment when I had to take that walk over there and I was like, hey, let me holler at you about, you know, I was my posture was all like bravado to let me holler at you about this, man. Yeah. You know, so, so you know, remember when it had, you know, and, and it really ended up being the dude was like, hey, you know, I'm I'm not doing it, it, it was healing for me. And but it didn't go the way I thought it would go. But it, but it, it, it came full circle in me, and I was good, you know. Yeah. Um, and then the other time, it was the, the other person was just like, "Hey, you, I was just in a bad place in that point in my life, and anything wow. that was in front of me, I was trying to burn down. So it really didn't have nothing to do wow. with you. It was just I was around you more, and I was like, you know what? I'm glad I know that now. And then again, it just that is full. I'm done with it. I can move on from it. Yeah. So I think healing is for us. It's yeah. not for for the other person and we and and we have to know we can't healing can't be contingent on how that other person processes what you want to happen or even validates it you know because you can feel, I, I'll tell I'll say this I wrote a letter to my to my dad to my to my biological father I don't know if I was graduating high school graduating college I felt like there were some things that he didn't do that I felt like he should have done so I figured, all right, when we get on the phone, it's just going to go back and forth. We ain't going to get anywhere. So I wrote this long letter and it was, it was, you know, it was long. Um, and I'm thinking, all right, he's going to really like have this watershed moment and see it my way. And he read it and he was like, no, son, I feel like I did the best that I could do. And I felt like I was giving him rationales on why, I, why he didn't do the best that he could right. do it from my perspective then. Right. And he was just like, no, nah, I did the best that I could do. And I thought to myself, I can hold this against this man mm. until he sees it my way, or I can just concede like, like he, this is how he feels about it. Wow. And we can agree to disagree, but is it worth me not having a relationship with my dad? Mm. No. So the sending the letter was the healing part. What I was receiving had nothing to do with the healing. It had everything to do with reconciliation but it, the healing part was the letter. It wasn't how he processed the letter. Exactly. So that's the, that's the thing with healing. I think people need to just go into it knowing that you need to get this out of you, so that it's whole, so that you can mend. But you can't get it out of you and then be mad about how somebody because you get right back to being hurt again. Exactly. You know exactly because we go with these preconceived notions, like you said, just just with you know, friends that I have, and I'll, I'll keep it on black men specifically, they're, they're, and this is a generalization, obviously I have a different perspective because I'm not a black man, but having conversations with friends, there's always been, most of them have like some sort of fractured relationship with their fathers, and mm -hmm. a, there's a lot of hurt there, and, and pain and misunderstanding, 
and a lack of the ability to be vulnerable, to share those really intense and, and, and painful, you know, feelings and trauma, because they're so afraid of, well, what will it look like if I open up all of this stuff and I don't get the response to be like A, B, C, D. And I'm mm-hmm. always like, I, I I recognize what you're saying is is a task and it's difficult, yeah. but it can't be contingent on receiving it to look this way. You have to be able to release those things that have been done and be open to whatever the possibility of that response is. Because at the yeah. end of the day, we, al- we liken it to you drinking poison, hoping somebody else dies. And that's you're real. the one that's slowly atrophying on the inside where the other person is living whatever life they live in that ain't got nothing to do with you. That's real. That's real. We And we don't, I think because there's a, a compound, like a compounded complexity to our Black men, uh, to our existence. Yeah. I think the one emotion that we can tap into really quickly is anger. Yeah. And I mean, we can get to anger fast and, and and anger has probably, you know, been the driving force for, for some people to be successful too, you know? So, so there's, there's different reasons for why we can get there, but we can get there. Yeah. The hardest thing to do, well, a hard, a hard thing to do, I don't know if it's the hardest, but a hard thing to do is to get past anger to get to understanding because Mm -hmm. anger somewhere in there we feel disrespected and because black men have been disrespected for so long that that is like a a, like a trigger for a lot of black men and it's different when non-melanated people hurt you on your job or at your school or at whatever but it's a whole different level where the person that brought you into the world that looks like you or that you look like has hurt you and you got to get past anger to get the understanding when that person is genetically connected to you yeah which makes what makes it which makes it probably harder for some brothers to actually feel like they are going to talk this out with of their dad their uncle their whatever who had like particularly in, in particular their dad specifically their dads but I just had to learn like I can't stay mad at this man like I the the best thing was knowing that he heard me and I heard him and we still loved each other and we can get past this but that's a reciprocal kind of situation where he has to be able to hear me and move on. And I have to be able to hear him and move him, move on and value what that means. Um, you'll, I think it takes it, it, the, 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 the timing of that is also like the stage of life, you know, twenties, thirties, forties, fifties. I think the longer the, 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 you know, the older I get and the more I have lived experience, the more empathy that I have for, older people in my life and particularly older men and, and, and then older men in my family. Cause in their twenties, when you're 10 and seven and something happens, you're like, why do you even do that? Like, that's crazy. I don't even know. <laughs> yes, I was. And in our twenties, they're 40 and we're, we're living our lives. So we can't even be reflective about what, what they did in their twenties. Right. We just see the mistake or the, or the bad judgment or whatever. And we judge them. It's not until I've lived a little bit of life and I went, mm. all right. Nah, yeah, 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 yeah. Like I, I see how that could go bad. Yeah, I see. I see. Like having a temper. How okay? So when I want to talk crazy, like yeah, okay, okay. So and then you, then you see them more. So it takes some time too, um, to really be empathetic about get how much it's gonna take to get past the anger, um, to get to understanding for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you've said so much. I, this could go on forever. And I just, I know we haven't touched on community. So I have a really just one impactful question. Go ahead. And I'm just plugging up. I'm just plugging my up. Uh, okay. Yeah. There we go. All right. And it would be when you think about giving back to the communities that you belong to, 
what 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 has that looked like for you what does that look like for you what would you like that to look like as far as what you're putting out into the world to make it better um so i've spent this is my 20th year in higher education and i've spent uh 11 years working at historically black colleges i worked at i went to clark atlanta university um i worked at clark atlanta university worked at morehouse college um, I did a, sm a small stint um, in the English department at Spelman, uh, in the education department at Spelman before working for Georgia State University. And then um, I worked at Langston University in Texas Southern. Um, and so I got into education uh, because I was, I, I wanted to help all students. Like I'm invested in all students, but I'm emotionally connected to the experience of Black students first. And, and then, you know, Brown students for sure. But I'm connected to our experience first. And so um, from a from a professional standpoint, I feel like the the over half of my career has been dedicated to showing black students that they can do whatever they put their mind to and helping them develop socially, physically, intellectually, culturally, educationally, and spiritually. Like I didn't I don't want any anybody that's ever been around me in a professional setting students or maybe even even colleagues I don't want them to ever think that they didn't have somebody that was willing to invest in them because I was yeah. um and so and I am for for some that are you know they're not my students now but I'm still writing letters of recommendation I'm still going to weddings I'm still you know doing all this stuff so um I think that professionally if 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 anybody says that I haven't been invested in the community in my community they don't know me at all, you know. Right. Um, I think outside of the profession, um, on personal levels and just in various sub communities, I think my contribution has come in the form of being a mentor, a sponsor, and an advocate for different folks in the community. So whoever needed mentorship, I'm gonna take you under my wing and go, hey, look, let's talk about this. I'm gonna give you some strategy and game and it's you do with it what you will, but but you have somebody you can rely on. Yeah. Um, and then with the sponsorship, it was like, I'm gonna put this person on. Like, hey, so Kendall is the best counselor in Asia. Y'all need to know that and do whatever you can to give her more opportunity. Like, I think we need sponsors, you know? Um, and then I tried to be an advocate, like somebody who is for uh, where a melanated individual is going. Yeah. And I continue to help them move that needle. And so that's what it's looked like for me in, in various, again, in our community as a whole and then in sub communities, be it students or friends or colleagues or just people. There's people that on LinkedIn, I have no clue how they, why they even care. There'll be some brothers that'll reach out and be like, hey man, I've just, I've seen your LinkedIn. You started in the States, you're, over, you're abroad. I think I want to go abroad. Can I talk to you? And for me, I think that, you know, I've, there's been a whole, there's been a lot of brothers that have flaked, you know, mm -hmm. on me as I, I, you know, ascended and they've been like, bro, if you need some, I got you brother, just reach out and email and blah, 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 blah. And I've done it and didn't receive like a, an email back saying, Hey man, I'm busy. Can we schedule right. in a month? Nothing. Yeah. And I just thought I'm not going to be that person yeah. because I'm I still, this is 20 years. I still remember that, you know, I still remember who they are. I still look at them at conferences like, Dog, you, you, before I became a vice president, you didn't even, you didn't even know I existed. But then all of a sudden, I get a title, and it's like, well, we need to recognize the brother. For I'm like, dog, you, nah, you, you know, you were yeah, there like, on the what did it say? You wasn't there when she was shooting in the gym. <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean. Like, you like, come on. So, so I, so I just made it a part of 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 my my ethos. Yeah. And in my ecosystem professionally, not to be that person. So I'll get somebody, a brother on 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 LinkedIn. There's two of them that recently reached out and said, hey, can I talk to you? And they probably thought, like, I'm going to send this to this dude and he ain't going to respond. And I respond quick because I know what that feels like. And I want to serve as a mentor, sponsor or advocate in some yeah. way, because for black men that don't get that, we got to figure this stuff out on our own. And that's hard yes. because we are judged for what we don't know. Um, and feared for what we do know. And so you need somebody to kind of help you navigate the gray. Yeah. You know, and, and try to navigate that 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 whole balance of 
success and family and profession and mental health and physical health and whatever that looks like. Yeah. So that's that's how I try to do it. Mentor, sponsor, advocate, and then making sure that, you know, anybody black. I, I want everybody black to win. All right, Issa Period. Ray, listen. Everybody black. Listen. Everybody black. I am listen, I am so glad that we've been able to connect. Like I love your wife. I am a firm no. believer that God put, puts people in your path. Again, not just for you, but to further something. Like being connected to good people is always important. So this is my last question for you. What are you most yep. proud of? What am I most proud of? I think I'm most proud of, and it's not perfect. Let me let me preface by saying that. I think I'm most proud of trying to have a family mm. with the, and, and and using my values my values and the values that we espouse together as the you know the light on the journey that we're on because it is difficult to to do um and i say that i'm i'm proud of that because i have to make sure my walk with god is right because i'm the leader and so when it's not i can tell and then my family you know inadvertently suffers or something's off so it all starts with me in that relationship um trying to navigate what it means to have a health healthy marriage is is great but it is also very delicate you know there's two people trying to be one and that's not easy but it is doable and all of the particular in, in particular black men in my life in, in life that I've met that I look up to they all have families all of them um and so I draw strength and inspiration from those guys because it's not easy you know when people are like we've been married 40 years and they've had a career and kids are in college I mean it, look, it looks like it all happened like in a two-week span or whatever but I, I'm like so so let me know how they like bro look like we were both working at Wendy's at some point. And I'm like, y'all was working at Wendy's together? He's like, yeah, man, we working at Wendy's. And we, you know, she working the midnight shift. I'm working this shift. And then she got pregnant. And we thought, blah, 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 blah. You know, I'm like, yo. And so I just think that I, I don't want to be a professional success in a personal failure with the relationships mm. that are closest to me. So although... I falter at it. I think I'm most proud of trying to, you know, steward that experience to the best of my ability because I just really value what that looks like and also the legacy that that leaves. Me and my friends talk, you know, my my three closest friends back home talk a lot about legacy and what it means to leave a legacy um, with our families given all of the competing priorities. And so work is not hard for me. You know, like, I mean, work work has hard days and but right. like, I'm gonna get a job. I'm gonna make some money. I'm not, you know, but like really dialing into that personal side of it, which where, where I sit right now is, you know, my family trying to, you know, raise my son and be a, a good, you know, husband to my wife. And, and again, knowing that some days I feel like I'm firing on all cylinders. And then some days I'm failing at it, you know, and trying to figure out, figure it out. But I think that's the greatest challenge in my life. And that's the thing that I'm most proud of is that God has put me in this position and I chose this position and I'm trying to do the best that I can with it. So Thank we're just going to run on and see what the end's going to be. Listen, okay. With that good old Baptist uh, jiggle, I'll give it right there. <laughs> Do you have any last words for our audience? Let us know how we can follow you, reach you, connect with you. Um, because I know that somebody is going to be touched by this. Episode. I'm already touched. Um, and I know that it's going to be impactful for someone. So please share that for us. Yeah, yeah. Um, Raphael Moffitt, uh, R-A-P-H-A-E-L-M-O-F-F-E-T-T -T on Facebook. And then R-X Moffitt, my middle name is Xavier. So R-X Moffitt at uh, Instagram. Um, don't have TikTok. Don't have, I, mean, I have Twitter, but I don't really use my Twitter. So Instagram is probably the best way to do it. 
Um, and if any, I, I will say this, and I want to make sure I look in the camera when I say this, um, for any brothers out there that need to talk to somebody, and I'm not a counselor, I'm not licensed, I'm not any of that stuff, and I don't have all of the answers, but I do uh, know what it's like to kind of go, hey, I need to holler at somebody about this. I'm more than willing to serve as, as a sounding board or answer some questions or whatever that looks like. Um, so if you have somebody, a group of guys that you do that with, you can add me to that. Or if you don't have anybody at all, um, please feel free to reach out. Um, I'm not hard to find uh, at all. My, my email address is rafaelxmoffitt at yahoo.com. So if you want to reach out, you can reach me there too. And then we can connect because um, I think it's it's really critical for our community to stay together. And brothers live a very different existence around the planet. Yeah. Um, that's African Americans, that's uh West Indian brothers, and you know, brothers from the continent. Like we're very different um in the diaspora, but we all live a very complex existence. And I just want to make sure that every brother on the planet knows that, you know, if you need me, I got you. I don't have all the answers, but I'm here to help. So we are all in this together for sure. I appreciate the clarion call. And I, I venture to guess that you are going to get some people to reach out to you. I will do whatever I can. I mean it. Your mission. I know you do. Like, I don't get the, the feigned uh -huh. caring um, vibe from you. Um, and I'm a good reader of people and I don't get that from you at all. Um, I just, I'm very grateful for you offering your time for us today, for me to pick your brain and share your story. Thank you for your honesty and for everyone that's watching, I want to thank you for tuning in to another amazing episode of the Black Expat Experience. As always, I encourage you to keep taking risks, keep impacting your community, and above all, make sure that you make your mental health and uh, physical wellness a priority. Please share um, this message and your communities of influence, because with your support, we can continue to show the world that Black people belong everywhere. We are worthy. And we live abundant lives all over the globe. And so with that, I'm going to conclude and say thank you so much, Raphael, and peace to everyone. And thank you. Hold on. You keep it and edit this part in here. I'm going to keep it. Kendall, Kendall is dope. We need more people um, doing this, more sisters doing this. Um, more sisters in, in the international uh, space living an expat life. And so I appreciate what you're doing. My wife loves you. She was like, wait till you meet Kendall. Oh my God, you know, you gonna, you guys gonna vibe. We was vibing. So she from Texas. I was like, and I love Texas. I love, love my Texas folks, you know? So um, I appreciate what you're doing and continue to do the work and to and continue to help us, you know, try to figure out how we live uh, uh, lives that, you know, physically, mentally, physically, sp spiritually, emotionally, we're, we're thriving. And we need your expertise in that, in our community. Um, and and the more that we talk about this, I think the more people realize that there should not be a stigma around um, getting help. There is no such thing as self-made. And I think that you, nope. a counselor, really help us understand that, that nobody's self-made. Um, and and if it, particularly in a, then when dealing with matters of our head and our heart, we need somebody to help us do that. So I, I salute you. I appreciate you for really being trained and taking on that mantle. And let me tell you, I've been on a few podcasts and I've and I and, and people like really kind of set you up like we're gonna talk on this day. But Kendall was on par. Like as soon as the first email went out, like there was another one that came out and another I was like, she got everything on autopilot. Like it, like there's no reason for this not to be successful. So she handles business in a way that I think is top shelf. So I want to make sure I say that, you know, on this too, that like, this ain't no shabby kind of like, I'm gonna call you and then make sure like, it was like, I was on the emails like, okay, she got the questions and she got this and she got the depth. Like I didn't have to do anything other than show up. So exactly. um, you made it easy. You made it Thank easy. And I think you. you did it in a way. So that is that. the best endorsement. And I am so grateful. I want to make sure things are smooth so you can come and just be present. And you were... And I, I can't wait for us all to celebrate Thanksgiving together. If you can get some collard greens, you know what I'm saying? Just let I, see, I can't know. make those, but I can make a mean broccoli and cheese casserole. Whatever works. Like we I try got to make that. It, overseas, you got to try to just kind of pull it all together, you know, so. <laughs> Thank you, my brother. I cannot wait for us all to hang out. 
and we'll be in touch soon. Indeed, indeed. All right, thank you.